Okay, so hi everyone again. Welcome back for the third session and the final two sessions. The last one will be tomorrow. So just before we begin, let me share my screen. And what is it? Oh, okay. All right, can you see it clearly? Okay, let's join our palms together and let's recite together. Homage to the Blessed One, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the Blessed One, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the Blessed One, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one. Namo Banshi Sidya Moni Fo Namo Banshi Sidya Moni Fo Namo Banshi Sidya Moni Fo Thank you and uh, please believe your hand. So thank you for joining us again. Um, so this is the third session. Uh, as promised, we're going to talk about the three natures and um, dependent reality. Okay. So first of all, just before we just before we begin, I want to look at the homework for last week. Yes, uh, we ask everyone to do a sitting meditation 10 minutes a day. Okay, just for this first part, all right? Anyone who has done at least one time for the past week, just type in one to show, let me show, to show your results. Right. So we have at least one, two, three, four, five, five, six people, more and more coming. All right, great to know that. So any questions regarding the sitting meditation? Like when you are using your breathing or when you are doing because last week we were we were practicing how to um be mindful on our bodily sensation, like whether it's pleasant unpleasant, whether it's neutral, or you're just doing on breathing meditation, it's also fine. Yeah, the breathing meditation is actually the very core and basic practice. No matter how at once we are in a meditation practice, either you're a beginner or you are like almost, you know, go to the highest level in Samadhi, we are still using the breathing meditation. So please let us know. Or let me know if you have any questions regarding any difficulties. It's good. Okay, so when you have time or when you need to ask questions, just type in and let me know. All right, and, uh, and the more fun part, take a photo of your environment and identify areas that give us, they give rise to different feelings, right? Present, unpleasant, neutral. So I was happy that I would receive a couple of um, of um, uh, homework from some of our participants. So let's look at them. Which one first? Okay. I think this is from Louis, right? Um, Louis, you, you want to share a bit of thoughts about, 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 uh, about this photo? Yeah, sorry. I do have time to do the table. So I just yeah, type it yeah. out in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's why I just screenshot the whole thing. I know that that is how, yeah. how it works. Yeah, okay, this is my meditation room. So I meditate yeah. in this room every day and I do my homework in this room as well. So uh, the, the Buddha's image as well as the Buddha statue will give me a kind of like uh, calm and peaceful. And I, when I look at them, I'm ready to do my meditation, my homework. Okay, so there's yeah. a green color, yeah. Um, and the carpet and the, the the meditation cushion is kind of like it's comfortable, so it gives me a very good feeling. And uh yeah, the only red part I think is the window because there'll be people ah. passing by outside. So okay. uh, on and off you'll see people walking, uh, I mean you'll hear people walking past and then some people talking and things like that. So these are the noises where, where you will get distracted. And also mm. when I look at the soft toy on my sofa, I will tend to like 
just go and sit down on the sofa for a while and then ha, ha, <laughs> my, yeah. so yeah, isn't that the green mm. why is it red <laughs> uh that is distraction because i'm supposed to be doing my homework on the cushion uh, <laughs> yeah. yes it's interesting so mm. you know that you enjoy it but somehow there's there's there's, there's a voice on the other side of the brain that tells you no 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 yeah yeah yes. work harder on your meditation <laughs> <laughs> yes okay yeah great so yeah i really like that you have a very comfortable and really roomy meditation room so that's a separate room just for your practice yes it's a separate room that for is, practice. that's very nice i think i think for me everything there would be great for me i would really love that and then on this side of the room is actually a small table whereby uh when i do my homework i will sit there i will sit there instead of uh, on the sofa in fact i seldom use the sofa lah. It's just that sometimes mm. when you feel lazy, you know, you, you feel like you want to go there and lie down on the sofa, but so far, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So far is sometimes really uh, distracting. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I first moved in um, to where I'm staying now, me and my brother Monk, remember this house actually uh, we rented? We came in with all the, uh, um, uh, with all the furniture equipped. So in the middle of the big living room, there's a very there's a set of very cozy sofa and a very huge TV. I think it's about 70 inch. The owner was so kind, he left us for us to use. So I look at my brother Ma, I say, like, we are not going to sit in a sofa anytime in the day and watch a TV, right? So why are they here? <laughs> so you know what? At the end, we moved the sofa to the storage room. <laughs> and then we ask the owner to take back the big TV. So it's empty, right? And then we put four tables from IKEA. Mm. We set it up, then it became become our office now. So next time, maybe I can show you my, our photo. Our whole living room is just nothing other than a big office for mm. us to stare at our screen, to do our study and do our work. I think, yeah, this feel more like this feel more like our life <laughs> because I can't imagine myself sitting in a sofa with my brother Monk and then we watch TV together. I don't think that would be the life that we are going to have at all. So yes, so sofa is something, you know, I don't even though we know that we want to enjoy, but somehow, you know, it, it, it also like there's a different voices like, hmm. okay, anything else you want to add? Uh, actually, the 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 Buddha's image on both sides of the yeah. wall, it, it it actually helped. It actually helped and stopped me from actually lying down on the sofa. <laughs> yes, I I realized exactly. that you, you know yes, it, it really yeah. stopped me from lying down because he, you 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 cannot put your feet on on either side. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly, not, yeah. very smart way of doing it. Yeah, very smart way. Okay, thanks, yeah. Luis, for your sharing. Okay, let's look at the second one. I forgot which one this is from. Is it from... Okay. Are you online? It's from me. Yes, Sharon? it's from me, Venerable. Yep. Okay, come on, share with us. Why they are okay. green, why they are red. Okay, this is a picture of my school. And yeah. over here, this is where we have our recess time, where we have our break. So you see the green areas is the furniture where we can sit and watch the fountain and the fish swimming while watching, keeping an eye on the students. And then uh, for the blue portion, that area is actually the staff room. So it's a very clinical thing, getting work done, meetings, serious stuff. And then for the red part, that's the part where it's going up the stairs to my classroom on level four. Actually, it's yeah. not really red because it's good exercise when you climb up. But when you're climbing up and down six times a day, that's when it becomes red because it's very tiring. Yeah. I can imagine, yes. Mm. Okay. Is it true? Yeah. Is, it, is it a school that where you're working? Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is a big I, I always have this question in my mind. Like, I remember in my primary and secondary school, we have like we have five floors. I never I think we never install the uh the elevator in the school compound. I wonder if it's the same for all schools. Oh, no, in this school there's the elevator. So ah. there are times when I'm really tired, so we send the students up by the stairs and I'll take your leave. <laughs> you take the leave and you send your students by, by the stairs. 
that's, yeah, that's or, really or when they have gone home, yeah, then I'll take the leave. Uh, ah, yeah. okay. I yeah, but this really a school in Singapore, yes. But it's a bit different because this is a school for uh, special needs students. So it's um built in a special manner. Ah, mm. uh, I think like as like elevator is something uh, necessary because we need to take care of people with all kind of uh um uh, physical you know uh, physical situation. So some people are, are not able to climb a span, then they might be become something quite necessary. Yeah? Okay, mm. so red because you climb the stairs, staff room, there's a place to work. Okay, I can imagine. Sometimes can be a source of happiness. Sometimes could be a source of stress too. So excellent. All right. Thanks, Sharon, for your sharing. Okay, we have more to come. Uh, who's that? Okay, this is actually my room. So Office? this is, yes. Okay. So this is actually the room in my background, actually. <laughs> Okay, so uh, okay, maybe I just walk from left to right. Lah. So one of the great things is my computer. So I mean, I think, yeah, I, I feel enthusiastic when I look at my computer because I like working. I mean, I like doing my work on my computer and I use my computer for for Dharma work, lah, like, like for example, for this <laughs> for this session itself. So besides the computer, it's a red area that is the window, which I am a bit disliked lah, because sometimes it, noise comes in from outside and sometimes the heat comes in from outside. Then next to the window mm. is my car wardrobe, which I put in gray in gray because I feel neutral about it. Like I don't particularly like or dislike my clothes. Then besides my wardrobe is my bed, which I also put as a neutral feeling because I'm sort of like a bit split up over it. Like I think I enjoy sleeping, but I also think sometimes I sleep, I, I tend to feel like sleeping too much, so that's not very productive. Then besides okay. my bed is my alarm clock, which I put in red. So it's my clock, which I put in red because, you know, sometimes I just want to go and do my things, whether it be my work or my reading without caring about the time, but I really have to go and follow a schedule. So yeah, mm. that's why I have a bit of dislike for the clock then. Uh, okay, then after that, there's another green area, which is my meditation cushion, which I put in green because yeah, I usually meditate on it, so I like meditating, so it gives me calm and happiness. Yeah, yeah, isn't it interesting? You know, even a even a room that we always stay like spend most of our time, and there are areas that you know, if you pay attention, there are some areas that really give us the 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 feeling of joy. Like you know, when sometimes when you feel tired, oh no, oh, I'm going to be meditating for you know in fifteen minutes time. Sometimes you feel like you're looking forward to. But if your circle blue on your bed, maybe <laughs> okay. Sometimes it changes, yeah. The feeling may be happy, sometimes maybe oh I should be doing more. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly you know, we, we know how we feel like even just standing in a small space, you have different feelings. So sometimes the feelings can be shown in your mind, but sometimes your body will right, will actually give you signals of how you are feeling how you look at things. It might feel a little bit anxious. Sometimes your, your, your heart may be pounding when you're looking forward to something. So these are the signals that we, when we are doing mindfulness practice, so these are the signals that we try to pick up. So by doing this, uh, taking a photo and going to a space and, and try to emerge ourselves in the space and, and examine how we feel and how we look at them. So this is the first step of mindfulness, of understanding how we relate to our environment. And then we can expand the experience of when we are dealing with other people, like what kind of feeling arises. It's a very interesting experience. Oh, I mean experiment. Right? We can know that, oh, which type of people that give us a feeling of, uh, 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 I mean, tension. Uh, which type of people that give us a giving of joy when we talk to. So it all comes from our mind, right? how our mind checkers in making us believing that there are some people that we really like, some people that we are a bit dislike, you know, like you, you use the word mild dislike, right? So where is the feeling of mild dislike coming from? Right? So it's something that we like to examine yeah, in this course. Okay, thanks, Jopin. Thanks for sharing. Let's have uh, two or three more. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, okay, this is the kitchen. The, the owner of this photo, are you there? Yes. Yes. Right. yes, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh all right. Uh okay, on the the A, 
is the tabletop. Uh, I quite like the tabletop okay. because I can oh, remove yes, nice. everything okay. and then do my pastry. And then uh, the B area is like near the toilet. <laughs> uh, it's actually a place where I can add a table there and then uh, ah. do drawing. Yeah, some drawing. And then the the C is the light light uh, box. It's actually um, uh, some switches that I do not like. It's done wrongly, actually. Then I, we cannot remove it anymore. So uh, my husband did a light box for me so that I can uh, use it as a tracing tracing light uh, for my drawing. Mm. Then also, mm. uh, okay, for the D part, the D part is very depressing because that side is so high up. Then uh, spiders sometimes will, 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 will spin webs there. Then I always have to use <laughs> a vacuum cleaner to go and suck out the spider is like I sarsen so it's quite bad then the tap is a bit high so uh, yeah sometimes the water will spill out yeah that's all the rest are neutral okay. mm. oh yeah yeah you're in a kitchen yeah they give you some problems <laughs> some places where you enjoy places where you don't actually I had the same problem with the sink and a pipe we just we just got it sorted out we just got sorted out what we did was we change a whole set of the pipe. <laughs> <laughs> we change it. We just change it. Ours is like the water splash everywhere, and actually it wets the countertop all the time until part of it has has become so moist that uh, I think it's somehow broken. So we decided we need to change the tap oh. at the end. Yeah, I yes, mean yes. now, um, me and my brother monk like just before yesterday. Now, none of us like to go near the sink and do the dishes. We're like, oh, every time we've done the dishes, we have so much, like, this, we have so many things to wipe dry. And now it's fine, okay? At least I am enjoying the kind of ah. convenience after I'm changing it. So, yeah, where does the feeling come from again, right? Uh, you say that one part of it is the box is wrongly uh, installed and things like that. So, what are you going to do, right? Are we going to just every time look at it and we feel the same, uh, what, uh, the kind of resentful feeling, or are we going to be angry at it, or what can we do, right? So, yeah, there's something that we have to think about, even in a small kitchen like this. Okay, thanks, Kit, for your sharing. Um, I have another, okay, let's do the next one. What's it? This is, I think, what building is it? Leaves ground present. Okay. Calling for the owner. Are you there? No. Okay. Just if not, then I just simply go through. Um, we have beautiful trees because give you a pleasant feeling, having a good feeling of the nature. Okay. See birds, dark grounds, unpleasant. Why is it unpleasant? got to give off ghost story feeling when dark and have smelly, smelly smell sometimes. Oh, okay. Okay, leaves, pleasant. The air is very fresh in the morning, thanks to the leaves. Okay, you want a garden, right? There are sports that we don't really like to go near to. All right, thanks for this participant. This is very good uh, observations. Okay, this one. Yeah, this one I really broke into laughter when I became a good love when I when I, when I saw this. Yep, <laughs> this one um I we woke up like five a.m. and uh, right up to Upper Pierce, so I always go there to catch sunrise. So okay. the uh, feelings generally is very pleasant, uh, except you know when you cycle up, of course it's panting lah, but um. Uh, when you're hot and sweaty, sitting down there is, uh, and then get, what, while you're waiting for the sun to rise, um, the feeling is actually very uh, nice. Especially every time the sunrise is very different. Sometimes you get to see the sun. Sometimes you don't get to see because of the, you know, uh, dark clouds. So uh, the only unpleasant things, of course, the mosquito because sometimes you can hear them, you know, going around <laughs> your your head. So especially now the dengue. 
uh, uh, has been yeah. there. Uh, so, but of course, we we spray uh, we spray uh, this uh, uh, what you call the uh, insect repellent. So overall, mm. it's a very uh, very pleasant, very nice feeling. Uh, watching the sun rise every day. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. I do like watching the sun rise. Even the sunset too. Yes. I, I I remember once I took a picture of the sunset and uh, actually I could never tell the difference between a sunset from a sunrise. Exactly. Yeah, you, you can say even this is a sunset too, right? I think everyone will believe you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, how can you tell? I really don't know how, how to tell the difference. So, but yeah, it's wonderful. Mm, thank mm. you. So when there's too many mosquitoes, yeah. Okay, so almost impossible to circle there. All right, thanks <laughs> yes. for your sharing. Thank you. Okay, let's look at the last one. Man, who is this? We have a swimming pool. Oh, no, no, not swimming pool, the track, running track. It's a running track. So, um, yeah. It's so, Kenny? Picture. Okay. Yeah, 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 it's my picture. So, it's a track just next to the place I live. Um, what I like most is actually the combination of color, the blue color on the track and uh, the plants beside it in green color and somewhere far from it got a mountain. So it all give me a sense of energy and mm. also give me a sense of refresh and relax. Yeah. So that's why I would think they are very pleasant for me. But um, mm. the holes on the track, I just uh, circle it with, with red color because um, it's kind of make me worries. People may mm. them over when they run over. Yeah. Me. And also the shadow underneath the bridge. So, you know, I can't really feel the sunshine. So, so, <laughs> this, so I just circle it as well with red color. And the building beside, because there are far too many buildings in the cities. <laughs> so I think it's quite dark. So I think just uh, neutral. So I just mark it's it a, black. Oh. It's neutral. It's black. Yes. Okay, yes. that's that's another feeling too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It seems that you are you are you are a very um sporting person. Yeah, you like to do the exercise yeah. a lot. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Do we can we come to a conclusion that you know when we are looking just a simple sport like a place like this, we have different feelings toward it, whether we like it, whether we dislike it, or whether we feel you know neutral about it. So no matter how big the place is or how small the place is, there's always sports that we find we feel pleasant about it and we feel unpleasant about it. So if we apply it to our relationship with other people, this is exactly the same, right? When we say that, oh, I don't like that person, right? So next time we can take a photo of that person, right? Circle him up. Which part that you don't like? Is it the head, the nose, the eyes, or the hand? Right, try to analyze and find at least find one or two sports that you really like. Oh, I enjoy looking at his hair. Maybe he's a bit annoying, but at least his hair is very stylish, it's shining right all the time. So maybe that is a method for us to train to see things from different perspective. Right. So because from the Buddhist point of view, there's never anything that is completely pleasant unless you achieve nirvana. But that is not possible when we are still here, when we're talking here. So there's nothing that is completely pleasant or completely unpleasant. For same as person, there's no one is completely annoying and no one that is completely lovely, lovely to us. So, so this is a technique. I think I hope we can go through tomorrow. That that is a question that we ask ourselves all the time. How do we deal with anger? Right, when we talk about uh, yoga chara, we talk about all the mental factors, all the all the emotions that we have had in our mind. So the practical way of dealing with our emotion, of course, is to understand them, and then we find a way to tackle our anger. I hope we can go through the exercise tomorrow. But this is one method that we can that that I always use is when we feel like we don't like anyone, we hate someone. Analyze it from different perspective. Draw something about this person. Tell yourself what exactly that you don't like about this person. And ask again, 
maybe there are few sports. There's few. There are few characteristics that you actually mm, tolerable. You can tolerate them, or you or, or you even admire them. So when you release them down, right? Usually at the end you will find that oh, no, it's not too bad. Yeah. So some most of the time the anger. It just dis it just disappear after we do the analysis, but of course it's very hard to do when we are still at you know at the highest point of our um of of the anger. But there is something that we need to practice. So from doing a picture of an environment is so the same principle apply to whatever we are dealing with every day. Yeah. So this is uh, the yoga chara way of uh, how to deal with our mind. All right. So up to now. Any questions? Anyone want to add anything? All right, let's do a really quick um, refresh of what we have been talking about. We talk about the central principle of yoga chara, right? We talk about mind only. In Chinese, we do we call it wei shi. So when someone asks you, okay, you have been to the course for four weeks. And you talk about yoga chara. You talk about mind only. So, what is yoga chara? What is mind only? What 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 does that mean, right? Does it mean that? Well, if you don't call mind, the, the, sometimes you call it consciousness. Consciousness is oh, it's the same meaning, it's synonym to the mind, but it's the way of cognition, right? So, does it mean cognition only? Does it mean that? Everything that we experience outside our mind is unreal, and only the mind is real. Is it really the definition of consciousness only? So this is a question, or this is actually the debate that has been going on for a while, especially in Indian Buddhism, because um, uh, there are there are many misunderstanding about yoga chara when they talk about wei shi, right? The term itself tell that only the shi, shi refers to the mind. So that only the mind is real, everything else is unreal. But actually, this is not really the definition. So let's re let's recap. So this is the definition of um, mind only, right? There's nothing out there but the transformation of consciousness, right? The transformation of consciousness. It's not just a consciousness. We talk about all only consciousness. We might think consciousness as some. Uh, as a thing, as a, as an object. Oh, there's a consciousness. The, there's a mind, and uh, there's other people out there. So we think we might get the misconception that the conscious is 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 real. It's like a soul, like something you know. It's like it's, it's like something that's hanging there. But actually, it's not. Your God talks about consciousness. You always say about the transformation of consciousness. So how do we understand the transformation of consciousness? It's like you remember last last week we were talking about how the water flow in a stream, right? When you try to catch, take a photo of the moment, what what you can see is the water is not actually one thing. It's a continuous, like a flowing of countless little droplets. So when they flow so quickly, we thought it's as if it is a real thing, a stream, something solid. You can touch it, you can yeah. feel it, right? You can, you can use the benefit um our, our activities. It can also destroy everything around our environment. But actually, it's nothing. The stream is not there. It's just little droplets that make us feel that it's a stream. So this is exactly the same definition of mind. The mind is not something that we can catch, and the mind is not something that oh, the next time we got the same mind again. You know, it's not like a soul or something. So it's a, a transformation. I remember, like the most inner part of our our unconscious mind is a seed, right? The seed transform into our experiment, and then transform to our cognition, and then from there we understand things. We, we interact with the environment. So everything comes from the seed. And the seed itself is nothing other than the transformation of keep rolling like a bit of droplets. They keep changing form, changing shape. So the whole thing is like an energy. If we, if we want to use a modern term, it's like an energy. So if you want to explain to other people in, a, in one sentence, also what is Wei Shi? Right, what is mind only, or what is consciousness only? You can say, "Oh, 
is nothing but the transformation of consciousness. Right? Even though you cannot explain more, but the moment you say this, I think they can show people that, oh, this guy knows something. <laughs> so, well, just bear, just keep this in mind, right? Don't worry if we still, if, if we still don't really understand what it means by uh, the transformation of consciousness, but slowly we'll get to that, right? So this is just a recap of it. So what's, why in Yoga Chara we want to mention that the mind is nothing but the transformation of consciousness? It's because it want to challenge, challenge our assumptions about what is real, what is true. Right? And then it comes to the question of, can we really trust what we see? Can we really trust our senses? Like there's so many short videos in YouTube or Instagram that show, oh, you know, some people, when they started to talk to each other, and then maybe they misunderstood each other, and then if each one, every time in an argument, everyone always think that he or she is correct, he is right. So that's why argument happens. Right? So the reason of learning yoga chara is about to test ourselves whether our assumptions about what is real and what is unreal is correct. So we have to keep questioning. All right. So give a very quick example. Look at this photo. What 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 do you see in the first place? All right. Can you type in the chat box what do you see first in the chat face? I think there are only two answers, or maybe three answers. All right. Okay, we have cat, we have mouse. Okay. Anyone else? Cat and mouse? Hmm. Rabbit. Oh, rabbit. Interesting. Okay. See small mouse in a black cat. Well, you're smart. <laughs> All right. This is what we call illusions. Illusions. So how I found this picture, I mean, many of us may have seen this before. I just go into uh, Google search and I have uh, optical illusions. And this is the first photo that came out. Right? You, you can try that. Yeah? And accordingly, this is a very famous optical illusions because it depends on what we see. First, either it's a cat or a mouse. It tries to uh, analyze our, our identity. Like, our characteristics, what kind of personality we have. Right? So I read about the articles and they said, well, for people, right, for people who see the cat, okay, like, okay, myself, I also see the cat first. For people who see the cat, it shows that you are the, you are the kind of person who, uh, who is really dependent, who is independent, uh, who is self-sufficient, right? And, and, and for those who see the mouse first, it shows that you are the you are the kind of person who are more resourceful. Right? Uh, you are the kind of person who has a better connection with people around you. Well, I don't know how they come to this conclusion. It seems to be like a um, psychological test or something. But this is how it works, right? If you go to online and you see so many what they so-called psychological tests to try to find out our our trait in personalities. Right. Sometimes they give you a picture to identify. Sometimes they give you questions or answers. So what are they, are they trying to do? They're trying to see the pattern of our thinking. Right. So the pattern of our thinking it becomes like it's, it's, it 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 becomes like a, somewhat like a path that we always follow. If we have the same, let's say we have a characteristic, certain characteristic, it forms like a pathway, and that pathway it becomes so concrete that we always follow the same path no matter what we're doing so this form our personalities so this is the explanation coming from the psychoanalysis right so they say oh everything you see everything even some some, some even analyze dreams it's oh what will you see in dreams it might tell you something about yourself your future and your past well i don't know i don't know how the theory works but in general, this is just a mind, right? And we're talking about the consciousness, how the mind 
how the mind thinks, it becomes a habit. So that habit, when it's strong enough, it becomes a fixed pattern. So this fixed pattern is how we define ourselves. So by learning yoga chara, it tells us that the way we see things, it depends on what is what our habit was, how our habit was formed. Right? We know that our mind, whatever we see, whatever we think, whatever we hear, the mind actually colored it. And then we give us another perception, add-on um, interpretation of everything that we see. So this is how the mind play the tricks in us. Okay? So for me, it doesn't matter if you see a mouse or a cat in this photo. Because what I did was, when I stand far away, all I can see is a cat. So when I, when, when I look close enough, I can, all I can see is a mouse. So what, what, what does it tell us? Right? It tells us, if you want to have a cat characteristic, stand further. If you want to be like a mouse, become more resourceful, stand closer. You know, just kidding, yeah. But but so in yoga chara, we always say that there is our characteristic is not fixed, but it's always changing, like the flow of the water. All right. So this comes to the three natures of the transform objects we talk about in the yoga chara Buddhism. Right, the three natures of okay. I just give you a really quick name. I then we explain each other. First of all, the first thing is about the object that are merely illusion, right? The three natures. That means that everything we see in front of us, around us, they have these three characteristics. The first thing is what we see can be illusion, right? Objects that are merely illusion. And, as, and, an, and, a, and, and another aspect of it, the objects that derive from the true appearance, enough falsely perceived. In Chinese, they call it yi ta qi xing. Okay, whatever that means, doesn't matter. And the last one is the object as they truly are. So in Yogacara Buddhism, it always tells us that everything we see around us, there are three possibilities for us to understand it. The first is we either we completely misunderstood it, so it became an illusion. And the next thing is, well, we somehow closer to the reality, the truth, but we are still wrong in certain way. So that is a second way, right? We see the true appearance, but somehow we didn't see it perfectly correct. And the last one is, of course, things as they truly are. Okay, why? Why do we need this kind of categorization? And then this is very important to yoga chara Buddhism in terms of practice wise. Okay, let's let me go to an example and and uh, you understand how this works. All right. Imagine, right now, maybe the school holiday, we go camping with our family. Uh, and at night, right, we're sitting in the campsite after the long night of campfire, singing and dancing around. And then we went back, everyone go back to their tent to sleep. And in the middle of the night, at two o'clock, you feel like you want to go to the toilet. Right? You, got out, you got out of the tent, and the environment was so dark, so you're walking on a path that leads you to the toilet. And suddenly, you saw that, oh, you felt that you kicked on something. And you turn around, you saw like a snake. It was a snake right, on a path, and you just step on it. So you were so scared, you ran back to your tent, and you scream and yell, and you know, and you didn't dare to come out anymore. So you waited until the next morning, all right, and you told your friend there was a snake there. You know, I stepped on it. I think I think I killed it, but it didn't bite me. So you went out with a friend to do the to to survey to see what happened. And, well, and what was there was actually it was a rope. It was a long rope that looks like a snake in the dark night un under the dark sky. Okay, so then oh, then you wonder. Okay, so that is actually a rope but not, you know, but on a snake. All right. Then your friend, yeah, maybe he's a scientist or, or somewhere, or, or, you know, or, 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 in a, or quantum physicist, they pick up the rope and say, no, my friend, this is actually not a rope. 
Look, so he unwind all the strings, you know, that bound together, become the become a rope. He take off piece by piece, and he keep tearing the little piece of fiber. Look, no, this is not a rope. It's nothing but some fibers bounded together. So these are just fibers bounded together. But we'll give it a name we call rope. All right. So let's ask ourselves, what is exactly there? We see the same thing, right? Lying right in front of us. So in the night, you thought it was a snake, but definitely wrong, right? So that, that was an illusion. But then in the daytime, when you look, oh, it's a rope. I can pick it up. I can, I can use it to tie up boxes. I can use it to do anything. There's a function of it. There is a rope. Of course, you believe there's a rope. No doubt. But when your friend try to analyze and tear up piece by piece, see? so where's the rope? There's nothing but fibers. Fiber is not a rope. Fiber cannot do anything. No, it, it cannot tear up the box. It has no strength. You can have it do anything. And you keep tearing. Right? So this is what the uh, quantum physicists do. They keep tearing things apart. They keep destroying things. Right? It's oh, this is a matter, right? They have molecules. And then they use a microscope to see, oh, we have molecules there. And wait, wait, wait. A molecule is not the end, right? Mo mo molecule is nothing but a big, big circle, right? Big, big thing. Inside, there's a nucleus. You have a neutron inside. It's surrounded by what? Electron and proton. Actually, an atom is not something solid that you can, you know, that you can pound on. Actually, an atom is a, it's an empty space, look like a sphere. Surrounded by flying electrons and protons. But is it the end? But no, we keep going deeper and deeper. Say, oh, no, no, no. Atom is still not the smallest. It's, atom is not real. You look at a neutron, right? Even the atom itself, in the center, the neutron itself, we have something even smaller called quarks. And now we know even the quarks is something smaller called strings. So at the end, we pick up a matter and we keep chopping. No, and we keep making it smaller and smaller until the end we find the strings. But who knows? Maybe 10 years from now, we get, oh, there's not a string. You know, it's something that you can even cut smaller. So at the end, it becomes what? Empty space. Everything just disappears. But this is why, this is how the quantum uh, mechanics, they come to the conclusion that um, matter is not real. It comes from energy. That's why we say last week that this is why Einstein's um, uh, equation of uh, E equal to mc squared works. E is energy, m is matter, the mass, like the C, the speed of light. So energy can transform into matter, matter transform back to energy. You see, transform, transformation. What we just said about what is Yogacara mind only? Transformation of consciousness. So even in the physical world, something that we think is so solid and real is nothing but a transformation from energy into like little string. I, I'm just guessing, right? I'm not, a, I'm not a quantum physicist, but I think that would be the end. And then we come to become a quark, and then a quark become neutron, neutron form atom, atom form molecule, molecule form matters, physical thing. So we ask ourselves, so what is really up? there in the end we keep searching and we no answer so from your child point of view we had to doubt ourselves what we see as real we always analyze them in these three steps so what are the three steps first thing is illusion oh it looks like you know, it lo looks like a snake remember in, in the camera it looks like a snake so this is an illusion so in yogacara this is a first level of understanding it's always an illusion so when it comes to a second level, and then because under the broad daylight, you see, oh, it's not a stick, it's a rope. A rope can be useful. So this is what we call the second level understanding thing. It's a perception because it turns out to be something more solid, more reasonable. And then if we keep digging, what is the truth? It comes to the highest, like the, the deepest level of understanding thing is, no, in fact, oh, sorry to the typo, in fact, it is actually what nothing other than swings energy. Right? I don't know what it is. We have to wait until you know we find the answer, but still we don't know. 
but so this is how the yoga chara um uh theory works it tells us about how we see the outside things it could be an illusion right if we are not careful and even if we are careful we are still depending on our perception and understanding and seeing things and at the end can we ever reach the final stage of the seeing what things are really are so this has become the goal it has become the goal of our practice right so why do we not to know this why do we want to categorize the understanding into three categories right um I remember when I was uh, well, just it really just it just happened a while ago when I was driving on a highway. I was driving back from Ipoh to Kuala Lumpur, so I was on a highway, right? You know, the highway speed is hundred and ten. So yeah, I was quite, I was, I was a very, um, I think, um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 good behavior <laughs> driver. I stick to hundred and ten, right? And then I was overtaking a, a lorry right right next to me. So the lorry was going much slower. I was slowly taking over, but then came a very, a very fast car. It was, I, I don't know whether it was going 140 or 150. So he wanted to overtake me, but I was overtaking the, the, the lorry and I couldn't go more than like 110, 120, right? So, but he kept haunting me, flashing. He wanted me to, to go somewhere, you know, to give way to him. So I look at the back mirror, I was like, where should I go? <laughs> I'm in the middle of taking over, you know, like going, like taking over the truck. Where should I go? So, okay, but what happened was at that time when I hear the honk, when I, when I saw the flashing of light coming to my eye, I don't know how you feel, but at that moment, I was, I was angry. I was like, what kind of person, you know, what kind of, um, a reckless person, like in, like like the rude people who do this kind of thing. At that time, I was really, I, I was, I was really angry. To be frank, so what I did was, I didn't even look back. I just, I even purposely slowed down a little bit, you know, just to keep, you know, to my hundred and ten speed limit. And in the end, when I finally all passed, um, the bus and the and the car right behind me, he didn't even wait until I. I went into the, like, the slow lane. It just overtook me like this, like zigzagging. And then like, it's almost like giving me like, uh, to, to show me how angry and uh, how impatient he was. Okay. And then he was in front of me. So, and then he purposely slowed down again. So at that time, what do you feel? I feel like my anger becoming even stronger and stronger. I was like, okay, I already tolerated your behavior. Now, after you got what you want, you still want to show me, you still want to take revenge on me. I think, what are you thinking? So that was my mind. Like, that, that was the little drama that I was having in my mind. I was, I was imagining a guy with big beard, you know, big size, sitting there, very angry looking, very impatient, like trying to score anyone that is on his way. So my, my image was so vivid that I was like, okay, you know, I was ready, you know. And because it was so, so I could overtake him again. I was thinking, when I look at the mirror next to me, you know, I might see someone who was ready to fight. So I was like, what should I do? Um, should, I, should I smile? <laughs> or should I show him my angry face again? Right, so these are all the little drama in my mind. All right, so, and, and the time came when, I, when we actually going side by side or overtaking. I saw this guy. He, he wasn't big. He looked at me and he was doing like this. Oh, I was surprised. Like, and then he said, sorry. I was like, shock. What are you doing? You no. Know? And then I uh, saw so wave my hand and then he drove away very nicely. Okay. What I'm trying to say is, okay, so this actually, I don't know what happened to him, but this guy was actually apologizing for what he did. He slowed down pur pur purposely to say that he was sorry to me. I don't know what happened, but I can show you the, the, all the three reality that I've gone through in that few seconds. First is what well, it seems like what well, it was an illusion. The guy was honking, like he was like overpassing me very dangerously. It seems like he's a bad guy, a very bad behavior driver. So that was my illusion. 
and the drama keep running in my mind. Okay, right? And, and the perception came when I actually we were side by side. I look at him and what? I know he was apologizing. I know that he was really in a hurry, right? And after he would talk to me, I think maybe somehow he wanted to say thank you or sorry, I don't know. But so it turns out to be that he was sorry about that. He was in a hurry. Okay. So that was like, we are a little bit closer to what actually happened. But still not yet the final answer, right? Who knows the truth? Because I didn't talk to him. He didn't talk to me. I didn't know what the truth was. Maybe, I don't know, or was he honking? When he was doing the honking, was it because he was anxious? He was angry or because he was worried? It could be anything, right? So these are, this is why by understanding um, the three, I mean, three natures of everything we see and we experience, we come to doubt um, our assumptions, our thoughts, because that our assumption about somebody else, somebody's behavior, always come from our previous experience, right? Or the drama that we play, they are all, they're, they're not real, but they're illusion. But if we don't take our time to slow down, to digest what's happening, to rethink from different angles, then we will, then we will be falling into a trap for our own illusion. And maybe the unfortunate uh, incident might happen. That has happened to many people, road accidents, road bullies. It's all coming from the very first impression that is always an illusion without knowing what was happening. Uh, but even our perception about that, oh, what guy was saying, sorry. Then even that, actually, we had, we, we still, that's still not the final answer, right? Maybe I was wrong. Then we think about, oh, maybe I was blocking the road. Maybe. Um, the speed limit for 110 is just for people like me. Maybe for other people, it could go maybe faster. I don't know. Right? So we start to doubt ourselves. Right? In the end, we think that, oh, so, so what lesson did I learn? I learned that it was a waste of time for me to get angry at a person like, you know, when you're, in a, when you're driving a highway and people like honking you or doing a, a reckless driving. So for me, getting angry becomes a waste of time that destroy our peaceful moment at that at that point. But to be frank, my my anger stayed with me for at least half an hour. Even after that, I was still like, <laughs> like how could people be rude? How could people be as rude as that? You know? But that takes me a while to digest what happened and to be calm again and enjoy the scenery again. So there's a lesson, there's a hard lesson I learned, but it was true. Like all these episodes that play in our mind, how it gives us illusion, how it's control, how it's had effect on our motion or on our uh, decision on what to do next. Right? So the so so the lesson is try not to act too fast. Always wait. Always wait. Right? Mm. So this is actually this is also a technique being used by uh, psychotherapy. If you go to a if if you if you go to a counselor and you say, "Oh, I have I have anger problem," or I feel sad, um, I just broke up with my girlfriend, or I just divorced. You know, you know what? Usually, what the uh, what the therapist will say to you, he won't give you an answer. He wouldn't say that's good or bad. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even give you the techniques to overcome your sadness or your, or your anger. You know what they do in the very first step? They're like a mirror. They repeat what you say to them. Oh, you sounded angry. Oh, I know you're sad. Oh, he repeat whatever you just told him for at least half an hour. Trust me. And that cost you about what? 200 ringgit, right? <laughs> okay, what, what I'm saying is, this is a technique that is, has the psychological um, principle behind it. It's because, as I just said, when we are able to see ourselves in a mirror, all these three natures of reality become a reflection. Right? We see our illusion. We see our perception. Hopefully, we can see the truth at the end. But by speaking out, 
to a mirror that has the ability to reflect to us what we just said by hearing what we just said from the third person perspective. This, gives, this actually gives us the way, this is actually a method of healing. Why is it healing? It because it makes us reflect on the three principles of the nature, whether it's, it's just an illusion, whether it's just our perception. We always come to the conclusion by ourselves if somebody is able to be a mirror to reflect our conversation, our thoughts, our emotions. So it works this way. So I remember when I go for the training courses for psychotherapy, I, we always spend most of the time practicing listening. Listening. Why? Because it's very important for us to be a mirror, to reflect to the other people what we see, what we hear. And by becoming a mirror for the other for other people, they have the capability to see for themselves whether they are going through illusion, whether they're just going through the perception, and we help them to find the truth by themselves. We don't give them the truth because nobody knows what the truth is, only themselves who experience it. So that's why, I mean, like the three natures of um, the yoga chart is actually used so widely in, in psychotherapy nowadays, okay? So now, now you know the tricks, right? Next time, you want to go to psychotherapy, you try to, you try to notice like how much time is used by the therapist to reflect on what you said. <laughs> Maybe 80% of the time, right? Trust me. <laughs> That's very important. I'm not saying it's wasting money. I think it needs technique, it needs patience, it needs a lot of compassion in order to do so. That's why we have spent years of training just try to be a good listener. Good listening, it needs technique, it needs compassion, it needs love, it needs to be able to, to empathize with other people. So that's the point, right? So that's deep rooted in the theory of Yogacara because the truth is never one truth. The truth is always, you've got layers. You have to peel it like an onion one at a time. It's an illusion, it's a perception, but the truth. Keep asking, keep doubting. So this is the spirit of yoga chara teaching. All right. Well, any question up to now? Or well, anyone got a story to, to share? Any more reckless driving experience? Or no? I Maybe mean, not so much in Singapore, right? Because, uh, well, the highway in Singapore, but maybe not as long as Malaysia. We have like, I don't know, a thousand kilometers from the north to south or 500 there. I don't know what is still... There's too much, there's too many highways in Malaysia, I can tell you. Too many. All right. So let's come to the illusion. Now, what we talk about the illusion? Because in Buddhism, um, the Buddha told us that there are actually many different categories of suffering. And he actually tells us that eight categories, but we're going to only talk about four now, right? He said, we feel sad. We feel that we are suffering. Most of the time is when well, we are separated from the loved ones. Definitely, right? When we're separated from our loved ones, of course we feel we feel suffer. And we are when we are when we are confronted with the one that we don't like, we dislike, we always have to confront them. No matter how um well, no matter how much we don't want feel like not going to work, you still have to wake up. You know, 7, 7.30 in the morning, get ready and get to work. So we have to go through the war, the same war every morning. Right? And inability to obtain what is desired. This is also one of the suffering that we, um, that we, uh, that we experience and the agitation of our body and mind. Yeah? Our body and mind uh, is always, um, changing. It's always, sometimes we don't feel comfortable. Sometimes um, we feel stressed. So these are things that always give us um, the suffering, right? But the Buddha called this illusion. Why? Sadness is real, isn't it? When today you have to separate from a loved one, that's why we see from the movie, 
but don't have safe from moving. Just go home and in your home. If your if if your if your partner tells you that oh I'm gonna leave you tonight, sayonara. You know, let's have a good life. Your the shocking news, your 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 anger, your sadness is real, right? So why the Buddha called this an illusion? Is this sadness not real? It makes us cry, right? Some there are there are, there are, there are, there are even some poets who say that actually the breaking heart is like a, what? It's like like a breaking wasp. The bleed can never be stopped, right? You feel like your heart is bleeding. Well, I mean, uh, um, I mean, well, basically the heart is bleeding all the time, right? It pumps the blood, but not bleeding in a sense, not so literally, but bleeding. So the 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 kind of the feeling is so real. So why the Buddha say it's not real? The reason, okay, is being that. So the Buddha used the sem- use the example of the arrow. The, there's a story about the two arrows. Okay. So the Buddha always you know, always use the example. He say that. Well, if, right. If you're shot by an arrow, let's say you are in a war time and you are shot by an arrow on your elbow. And what was the first thing that you, I mean, what will you feel? Of course, pain, right? Pretty painful, shock, um, unbearable. Right? These kind of feelings all comes up. So the Buddha asks you, what will you do when you are being shot by an arrow? The answer is simple. Get what? Going to see a doctor right away, right? Or we get medical attention right away. Or we pull out or we put medicine, cure our Cure the pain. So the Buddha asks again, will you ever, when you're shot by one arrow, will you ever pick another arrow and stuck yourself on your other elbow? On your other shoulder or elbow, whatever? No, right? So any, so any, um, everyone, no one will ever do that. Will use another arrow to stuck themselves by the second arrow. So this is exactly what we do emotionally, the Buddha explained. So sometimes you may feel pain, you may feel lost in life. Right? So this is like the first arrow that hit us. Oh, I'm so angry. Right? And then after we feel angry, there's another voice in the back of our head that tells us, oh, you shouldn't be angry. You are a good Buddhist. But how can you be angry? You should you should, you should look at emptiness. You should be uh you 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 should be more compassionate, you should love other people. And that kind of judgment is a second arrow that comes that we pick it up and we struck ourselves. But that is usually the second arrow that is more harmful than the first one. So in psycho so in um in psychology, they call this the primary and secondary emotional responses. Right? Primary means that the first um the very first uh, instinct or well, very first emotion they have like uh, shock, anger, right? These are the first, the primary emotion. It's real, like it happens to us. But instead of, after we feel anger or sad, instead of trying to deal with the emotion, we use another, we use more emotion to shock ourselves. Like, oh, why should I be angry to myself? Am I a bad person? Oh, because I'm bad. Then, you know, I feel angry because I'm bad. So this is how he treats me. So all these second thought, they are like called a secondary emotional response. And so it tells us that whatever um, that struck us is actually not that important. The important is the more important thing is how we react to them. So the Buddha say the first arrow hit us when a painful event occurs, and it hurts, of course, yeah, it hurts. But the second arrow, which is our reaction to the event only adds to our pain. So that's why what we, what we were saying just now, like all the separation from loved ones, confrontation with hated ones, inability to obtain what is desired, agitation of our body and mind, all of these are like the second arrow that, that we add on ourselves, right? For example, agitation of body, when, when we are sick, when we're having a fever, 
it's just a fever. It's a heat. Like your body becomes warm, right? You feel a little bit dizziness. All right, that is a sickness of the body. But when you're under so much pressure, you say you have to, you have to give a talk you know, at night to 30 older people about yoga chara thinking. And if you're like, oh, you're having a fever and you're sweating. So that kind of, um, uh, I mean, pressure, that kind of like, oh, what, why, why should I go to it? I shouldn't have gone out last night to the mama, you know, to, un until I got like, until I got, uh, in, un until I got infected, you know, by the virus. I shouldn't have done this or I've done that. So all these judgmental thoughts, they add up, you know, on the bodily, um, agitation and make us feel worse. So this is a second arrow. So the Buddha said, this is always, these are always um, the illusion to us. This is always illusion. Right? So think about something. So what other thing that, I like, mean, fear, fear usually runs on illusion. Think about one creature that you are afraid most. Think of it. Have you got nothing you're not that you are not feel? Yeah. I remember the most disgusting creature that I, I'm still thinking in now for me is cockroach. I don't know how many people agree with me, but for me it's cockroach, right? I always no, I'm scared of cockroach. I don't know why. But I do have a friend who doesn't have this feeling at all. Like he could reach his his hand very gently, like I mean, just put on top of the cockroach and slowly, you know, get it and hit it outside. Every time I saw one, he would do this and he can even he can even hold it gently in his hand and play with it. I was like, oh my goodness, stay away. Don't even come near me. Why? You know, the same thing. So at one time he taught me Look at this, you know, you learn yoga chara. Tell me, what, what is your fear? Where does it come from? But like, I don't know. It's just so disgusting. You're like, no, no, look at this. You know, he got like the tail, he got wings, he got six legs, he got a very muscular body, you know, like a, like, like, like a six pack. It's beautiful. I mean, it's nice. Wait, what is he disgusting about? You ask me. Well, I try to analyze, you know, I try to take a photo of it. And I hardly look at it. I could hardly look at it. I have to draw circles. Of, okay, which part that I dislike most? I try my best to analyze. At the end, I gave up. <laughs> I don't think it works for me. I still don't like cockroach now. I like cockroach nowadays. Okay, so that tells us knowing is one thing, right? Be able to do it is another thing. Of course, I'm not telling you that it's, it's undoable. We have to try. Right. But for me, cockroach is something that's out of my limit. I'm going to try something else, but not a cockroach anymore. I couldn't. I just still, I mean, I'm scared of it. Yeah? I don't know why, but cockroaches can, they always fly in the air. And they always fly at you, right to your face. And I don't know why. I think there's something always happened to me. You know, that's why I really, I'm really scared of them. Right. So think about it. But it's all illusion. Fear always work on illusion. Because we always think the worst that comes up when we, when we say that we are afraid of cockroaches. Every time I think about cockroaches, I can only have, I have only one image. If flying with the speed of light and come towards my eye, right in the middle of my eye. That is always my image. Like that's in my illusion, but it's so real. I don't think my mind believes it's an illusion anymore. My mind takes it as a reality. But yeah, I accept it. Though. I accept my my false understanding in this one, and I stay with it, I'm fine, so it's okay. <laughs> so yeah, this is illusion, right? Whatever is out there, depends on how we react to them. It gives us different feelings and suffering. So that's why Buddha say, the Buddha say, all the, all the, all the six, all the eight kinds of suffering, it comes from our own illusion. Okay, it takes time to absorb this, but that's true. All right, but well, the second one, what is, what are the objects that derive from true appearance, but, but end up falsely perceived, right? Like, like the, this is like um, the 12 link of uh, dependent 
origination. It talks about, um, well, it talks about how one thing leads to the other, like the domino effect, right? We have, let's say we have um, in the beginning, the past causes, because of ignorance, then we have mental, we have uh, mental formations, and then we have consciousness. And then one, because of one incident, one thing happened, it leads to the other. It's like a closed loop. So only if we can break the loop, if one thing happened, we don't react accordingly, then we are able to be free from it. So that's the whole purpose of the practice, to get out of our habitual thinking. So this explains to us why everything we experience in the world is nothing but cause and effect. Because of this, and then we experience this. Because of that, we experience this. Right? Because I had my previous bad experience of cockroaches flying towards my eye when I was a kid. And now for my whole life, I'm afraid of it. So that is the cause. How do I overcome it? I don't tell me, right? I'm not going to try anymore. So that is what we call by um, everything. When, when we know that everything that arises has its cause, has its reason, then we are a bit closer to reality. Like, 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 like the rope. When we see the rope, it's actually a rope, but not a snake, right? Because a rope has its cause and effect. A rope is like many fibers, they bound together and then they become something useful as a reason, as a cause. So that becomes the usefulness of the rope, make it something real, but not actually real. I mean, but still close enough. So that is what we call, we see the rope as an object that derives from true appearance, but and of course you perceive, yeah? The rope is not there, the rope is in our mind. We imagine it's a rope. Actually, it's not, it's just like a, a big power of fibers bound together. So this is a second level. And what is the next one? The object that they truly are. So what is it? It's really hard to explain, right? Only the one who have um, who are who are free can see the real reality of the thing. Like actually it's a liberation from images, emotions, language, assumptions. It's free of all this. It's, it cannot be explained, right? And there's no more discrimination between one person to the other. There's no you and I. There's no we, there's no they. Everyone is the same one unity. And the goal of Buddhist practice is what? Is to understanding the reality as it is and by how by purifying the alaya consciousness. Because we said last week that everything, they are just seeds in the alaya consciousness, right? These are the seeds that give rise to our daily experience. So they are not something that happening outside. So by purifying the seeds in Alaya Vishnana, when they are pure, so everything appears as they are, then we don't have too many interpretations of false perception on the thing that we experience, then we are liberated. So this is the way of practice under the Yogacara thinking, the purified Alaya consciousness. Of course, at the end, we need to we need to benefit others, right? So, but how, then ask, how are we going to purify the alaya, the alaya vishnana? How? So that's why attention is really important. Like attention leads to mindfulness, right? Mindfulness based on attention is whenever we have a feeling that arises, we have an emotion that arises in our mind, we know that, oh, I'm sooner going to get angry because I heard my child yelling at 10 p.m. You feel your heart is pounding. You feel your, your neck become a little bit hot. So, oh, I'm going to get, I'm, I'm going to scold them anyway. Whenever we have that feeling, right? So we pay attention to it. Ask ourselves, what is it? Am I going through? Is it anger? Is it even stronger than anger? Like what, furious? Um, is it impatient? You know, this is how we do. Try to look at the emotion. That, oh, I have anger arising. Oh, my mind is become agitated. Oh, I don't feel comfortable. So paying attention to it is the first way that we do. That's why we want to learn mindfulness practice and learn how to pay attention to what is important. So before 
we do anything that we're going to regret. Like on the highway, I just talk about, you know, if I wanted to really do my revenge on, <laughs> on a reckless driver, we would be like doing, I don't know, what kind of crazy things on the road, right? And that is definitely not wise. I think that is something not, not right to do. So pause, pay attention to what we're going through. Be frank to ourselves, tell us, oh, I'm going through anger. I have the feelings coming out. As long as we can do that, that is practice. That is going to break the cycle of leading to the next thing to happen. And by doing that, our seats of anger will become smaller and smaller. So this is a way to purify the ala which you know, there's no way else. This is the only way. So be mindful, pay attention. Okay? So I don't know any question up to this moment. So we just talk about the three reality. Uh, this is a yoga chara way of seeing the external world. And why do we need to know this? It's because it helps us to create better relationship. It helps us to overcome our emotions easily. Well, I mean, easier. I wouldn't say easily. Yeah? It's never easy, but a little bit easier. It gives us a method to deal with our mind and, and, and how we experience everything around us. We, we, we can give ourselves an option to see things a little bit different than before. Okay, so this is why we need to know the three natures and how to use them, right? But okay, now let's go and actually do it. Right? That's why the last part of this of this um of this lecture, we're gonna talk about uh that we're gonna do a practice. It's called mindfulness of emotions. Right? Okay, so but before that, um before that, just get ourselves a little bit warm up. Uh, I remember last week, uh, I promise, I promise you all, we're going to do something called standing meditation, right? I hope you remember. If you don't remember, we can just skip it. So we're going to do it, right? So this is what I, this is what I'm going to do. Standing meditation from this very lovely, illustration from 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 a japanese website and it really explain what it is okay put in a simple way right there are few things that actually is very similar to sitting meditation being mindful and pay attention right okay before we stand up and do it let me just really go through it quickly right there are few things that we that that, 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 that have to um uh, consider first when you're standing, keep your head upright, you know, gaze forward at a 45 degree downward. And of course, relax the soldiers, right? Put it on the side. Keep the waist straight and relax. Not too much, you know, don't force ourselves to go forward, but relax. And, um, and this is very important. The forward is very important. We try to lower our buttocks a little bit as if we are sitting on an imaginary chair. Easy to understand? but not quite easy to do. Anyway, we're going to try afterwards, right? And the fifth one is keep the knees slightly bent. Don't lock your knee like that, you know, like, oh, say not that. Very tight, but loose it, like bend a little bit. That's the way. And then do not like puff out the chest, like, oh, I'm, I, I want to show you know, myself to be very energetic. So you want to pop my chest like that. No, don't have to, but it's the natural. As long as we keep our, our, our back straight, you know, the chest, we can just relax our shoulders and this will be natural. And slightly engage your abdominal muscles inward, you know, slightly tuck in your tummy a little bit. Don't let it come out too much. Right? And when standing, the two feet, you are imagining your two feet are like the, like the three roots that's going down, like, 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 like growing downwards into the ground, deep into the ground. So you don't actually force your feet to be stable on the, you have that, you're imagining your feet is like the, the root of a, of, of, of a tree that's growing downwards. All right, you know what theory? Let's do it, all right? Want to um, stand up? I try to stand, I mean, as far as I could, so you can see me. Right, now we're going to do 
standing meditation. First, we can open up our feet, right? It's about, about the same um, stand width with our shoulder. Like you don't like you don't like close your feet like this, or you don't like open up like doing a yoga, no. But standing like as far as your like your shoulder, almost like the same width, that is the most stable position. All right. So when standing, so keep your head upright, like gaze forward forty five degrees, relax the shoulders, keep the waist straight and relax. Can you do that? Right now, the fun part. Lower a buttock a little bit. Like imagining your buttock is pointing downwards and you're almost sitting on a chair, but not sitting yet, but almost sitting on a chair. Right? That gives you a little bit of downward force. Right? You know, you, you will notice that by doing so, you will bend your knees like, automatically, right? Your knees will be bent. So that is a natural way. This is how our body structure works. So bend the knees a little bit, right? Draw in the chest a little bit, draw in the stomach a little bit, right? Now you, you, you can imagine your feet actually like a, like a going tree roots, they're going all the way down. Meaning it goes all the way to the earth to search for water. And there you are, standing in a way that is more stable and it doesn't use much of your of the force and if you ask me so how should we stand right they say imagine it's your feet right i know that in some kung fu or tai chi they will teach us oh you should you should be like this you know 90 degrees parallel but actually that is not what we are doing here we have to do that in a natural way slightly bent like this it's like a, a character of eight right you call it in chinese the zi xi. it's slightly this is more natural instead of this. So when there are people are training for qi gong, then they're doing this, right? But now we are not, we are doing standing meditation. So this is the way you bend it a bit, right? Natural, so they become a shape of a V shape. This is more natural in standing, okay? Right, let's try again. Standing firmly on the ground, head straight, back straight, Right, your buttock sits slightly on an imaginary chair. Bend your knee slightly. And of course, if you are in an MRT or something, your hand is still holding, you know. Mm. So yeah, this is how we are this is how we can be standing in the MRT when you're waiting, when you're in a transit to work or in a bus standing. So this is how we can practice. Stand very firmly. You can even close your eyes slightly. You can feel that the body is in the most comfortable way. It doesn't use force. And you can stand for a long, quite a long time without feeling fatigue. It keeps your muscles a little bit more relaxed. So what should we be thinking here? So when we know our body is stable, our posture is stable, you can come back to our breathing. Just know that we are breathing in. Breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. You see, your mind will be focusing on the posture of your body and you also pay attention to your breathing. So by doing this, by doing this from now on, there'll be no more wasting time when we are riding in MRT or in a bus, or even when we are waiting in a long queue, buying buying for the latest, I don't know, um, buying for the latest, most delicious bread that came out in the morning. I know Singaporeans like to queue up, you know, 
to buy something really nice. When I was in Singapore, I was a long queue. So I think people enjoying. But this is if you already have to stand for a while and wait for something. By doing so, no time is wasted anymore. Even when we are standing, doing nothing, we are practicing how to correct our body posture and how to how to pay our put our attention to our breathing and be focused in the present on what we are doing. So by doing so, no more time is wasted. Okay. All right. I hope we can do the exercise. Um, okay. Let's move on. All right, we talk about emotions. What are emotions in Buddhism? In Buddhism, we don't use emotions. We use, emotion is a, is a Western term. Actually, we say mental factors. Mental factors. It's just a different category. But we use emotion here for the ease of understanding. So, in Buddhism, we have the wholesome emotion. Just like the you know, we have three categories. The similar thing we have for the bodily sensations. We have the wholesome emotion, we have uh, equanimity, non-violence, modesty. We have unwholesome one, envy, arrogance, hostility. We have uncertain one, which can neither be good nor bad. So they are like a regret. Sometimes regret can be good, can be wholesome. Sometimes it could be uh very, 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 very destructive, you yeah, know, to the to, to the health of the mind, a sleepiness. Okay, drop in. Sleepiness can be good sometimes, yeah, because you need sleep. Don't, don't be um, too strict to yourself, yeah. When it's time to sleep, get enough sleep. So it's uncertain, all right. In Buddhism, in Yogacara, sleepiness is uncertain. It's not unwholesome. It's not. It's not an unwholesome thing. It could be either, and doubt. Doubt can be good, but like if you have questions, remember, if I doubt whether it's an illusion or is a something that is real, doubt some many times doubt give us uh, the way to learn the actual uh, truth. So the same thing in the Western psychology that like we have basic emotion like happiness, which is good, wholesome, sadness, anger, fear, disgust, and unwholesome one, and surprise, it could be uncertain. Like surprise at good things, surprise at unwholesome things. Okay. These are the categories of emotions. Um, the principle is we have to identify them. Uh, you know why afterwards. Why did you identify them? Name them. Identify them. Learn the name. By the first thing, learn the name. How? I give you a very beautiful um, periodic table of human emotions. Uh, what is wonderful, right? I really love this. You have love on the left corner, right? Empathy, severity, compassion, gratitude, admiration. This belongs to love. And then we have what? And we have the yellow color, joy, satisfaction, enthusiasm, euphoria. You know, euphoria is more like, you know, crazily happy, I don't think. Like, like it's, 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 it's like a crazy joy or something. Surprise, ecstasy, optimism, happiness. And then we move the way to red, right? We have like a bad mood, we have a fire on it, we have resentment, frustration, jealousy. If you look at the terms, either in English, either in Mandarin, in any language, each of the description of emotions are different, right? Resentment is different from frustration, and frustration is definitely different from jealousy and jealousy is not the same as envy and arrogance right we have to learn how to name them why why because in doing the meditation practice learning how to use the term can 
make us identify what we're going through. Remember, we want to do mindfulness practice is to pay attention. But when we are paying attention to emotions, we have to be able to name them. Yeah, if you cannot name them, you cannot pin down what is going through in your mind. Then what's the point of paying attention? But like, paying attention means that you look at it, you know what it is, you know they're different from like the the emotion I just said just now, and now I'm experiencing it. So being able to name it is the first step in doing the mindfulness of emotion. Right? So these are the it's a really basic concept that, um, okay, let's do a very quick um, exercise. Yeah, I have a few questions. Just, just to learn our uh, practice, our vocabulary. Okay, now, your parent who has found your nine-year-old child looking at a child, you say, what do you think you're doing? Okay, at that point, how are you feeling when you say that? Can you just quickly cut down, like any kind of uh, emotion that that you might have, yeah, randomly, like any that angry, furious, what else? Shock, yeah, worried, excellent. You see, irritation is shocked, curious. Oh, wonderful. Why are you smoking? Hmm, what brand is it? Yeah, I wonder. Is it marijuana? Ah, I'm just, just kidding, yeah, yeah curious how could my son do it right puzzled where did he get it it's expensive i know why did he got it right they got questions you see everyone has different emotions under the same situation but the thing is be able to name it right? you name it and to, to, to say it very clearly what are you going through okay next one your husband and wife and your partner just Told you that you're the most wonderful person in the world. How are you feeling at the moment when you hear that you're the most beautiful person, a wonderful person in the world? How does that feel to you? Nothing. Mm, okay. I really feel nothing. Happy, happy. And it's on top of the world, right? This is a very interesting um, uh, description. Failed. Love. See, these are all feelings. It could be stronger, happy, doubtful, <laughs> you see? Doubt is something, it could be good, it could be bad. Yeah? It depends on how you look at it. All right, okay, let's gan All right. Be grateful, full of energy. Exactly. So this is how we want to differentiate our feeling. Even if it's slightly different, try to use the the most accurate description to, to do that. All right, maybe another one. Okay, write down what you feel. In other words, your sisters is better than, your brother and sister are better than you. How are you feeling? I'm upset. Yeah, of course. Disappointed, sad, misunderstood, either either care or worried. Worried. Interesting. Oh, I mean yeah, you feel like your parents feel worried about you? Yeah. Yeah. That's a very interesting perspective. Frustrated? Yeah. Jealous or different. Contempt. Depressed. These are all the feelings we have. Nothing. Okay. You know, nothing is interesting, right? Nothing could be a feeling. What is associated with nothing? I can think about feel bored, right? When, when we feel bored, actually, if, ah, nothing, nothing what? Nothing interesting, right? When we're saying nothing, that means that usually we say nothing interesting or there's something, but it doesn't really get my attention. So it could be something like um, something boring. So nothing could also be an emotion, right? Think about it, right? what is nothing? Okay, right, I think you get, um, you, you get the idea. 
So I'm not going to do a few more because of time. Okay, let's talk about how we're going to do it, the mindfulness emotions. So it is more subtle than mindfulness of body feeling, of course. Yeah, Bodily feeling is just focused on one spot of the body and we tell ourselves whether it's pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, or neutral. But emotion, because it's, it's, it's much harder, right? You have to really look carefully. So what are we going to do? When emotion arise, observe and label them, right? Look at them, give them a name. It's jealousy is envious, right? As well as our thoughts and reactions. So when we feel angry, what is what are we saying to ourselves? Are we scolding ourselves, getting angry? Or are we feeling pity to ourselves by being by getting angry? Many, many different ways, right? Everyone is different. And then the more important is do not identify with them. Because yoga chara chara is that emotions are not me, they are not I. You tell you remember in the first class we talk about there's no I. There's no something that we call the I. But I is an is a feeling, right? But emotion is just another feeling. So emotion doesn't represent my whole like at least the self here, right? Myself. So emotions are not me. So that's why I want to correct something that we say sometimes. When you tell your friend, I, I am angry, right? I am sad. I am. What, 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 what does I am mean? Right? Instead of saying I am, we can say I feel angry. Oh, I have sadness in my mind. I have a feeling of loneliness. I have. I feel, right? So that by changing our way of talking to ourselves, next time you try to say, don't say I'm angry anymore. I have anger in my mind. Right? You tell your partner. When you say this, I feel that anger arises in my mind. Well, if you try to say this, I'm sure your partner will get shocked and like, are you okay? <laughs> and then you tell him or her, no, I'm practicing yoga chara way of thinking. I have anger in my mind, but I'm still fine. I'm calm, but anger is here. I will let you know my anger is arising. And this is actually, this is the truth, right? This is what's happening. I am, you know? It's not I am anymore. It's I have. I possess it. I do have the feeling. So emotions are like that. They're changing all the time. And the last thing we do is do nothing. When emotion arises, do nothing. Simply be aware and accept it. When I feel angry, I always tell myself, yeah, of course you feel angry. Yeah, it's here. I even touch my heart. Yeah, it's pounding. I know. The feeling is there. It's so vivid. So real. Yeah, I know it's here. But it's okay. It's fine. You're still you. You know? You know, whatever it is, just slow down. And you know what? By doing, by just doing like a, a very simple action like that, you know, in a short time, your anger will reduce. By itself, because all the emotions are are we call it inner child, like in a in a, in a psychological term, it's a part of inner child that want our attention. It because emotion has its functions. Why during the um call that um uh, in the evolution of human being, why do we need to keep the emotion in the amygdala? You know, all animals have emotion. Even plants have emotions too, but they're not. There's not a different way of function, right? It's a different way of there's a different mechanism, but they do have emotions. But why, in like a million billion years of evolution, we still keep emotions in our brain because it has function. And what is a function? Is to warn us about dangers outside. So by thinking in this way. Whenever I feel angry or you feel sad, tell yourself, oh, this is a signal coming from my brain. This is my self-defense uh, system telling me I'm going through something dangerous, whether it's from the outside, whether from the inside. So pay attention to it. The moment we pay attention to it, your emotion will be satisfied because 
their function is finished, right? They want to get our attention and when you pay attention to it, but this is against our common sense, right? Right, this is what we do. When I feel angry, we suppress it. No, I'm not angry. No, 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 no. You're kidding. I'm not angry, you know, but you're, you're, you're biting your teeth, but you're still telling yourself, I am not angry. That never works. Have you tried that? The more you want to suppress it, the more you want to deny it, it never works. So we have to go the other way around. Tell yourself, oh, it's here. Oh, yeah. Oh, welcome, man. I haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, good friend. Thanks for telling me. Angry. Anger. Thank you for coming back. Yeah, I see you there. Yeah, I see you. Okay, yeah, let's talk. Let's talk. I'll pat it a little bit. Let's talk. What is it? And why? And what should we do? Have a discussion. So this is a little inner child inside ourselves. So this is what mindfulness of emotion is about, right? Okay, enough for the theory part. Any question? Any question? Uh, Venerable, there's one question in the chat, but uh, it's already 9.13. Okay. Would you want to answer it tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, maybe, so maybe we keep I'll, the question and we you answer it tomorrow. For tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. so this is the mic. I just today, um, we are just going to do the, the practice on standing meditation and we, and I give you the briefing on mindfulness of emotions so tomorrow we are going into the the practice of mindfulness of emotion okay and also keep your questions i'm coming back i'll be coming back for that so if you have questions now before you forget you can type in a chat box and i will keep a copy of it any other question about emotions i can stay here for a few more minutes um, don't worry, tomorrow is the last session. We, we can have more discussions. We can talk, we can chat. You can yell at me and I try to practice my patience and we see how it goes. And I'll tell myself it's okay, don't get angry. Okay, time your questions there. Um, I want to apologize because I need to leave a little bit early today instead of until 9.30. So I'm going to keep the actual practice of mindfulness of emotions to tomorrow's session. Yeah. All right. Type your questions and I will look at them. Um, yeah. Uh, they, they, they can also type the question in the, in the chat group, uh, WhatsApp chat group. Yeah. Okay. So let me, um, all okay, right. very well. So can we now invite you to lead us in the delegation of the merits? A quick yes, one? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Let me share the screen again. Don't waste my function. I think I just lost that. Let me check. Oh, okay. I can see the screen sharing. Desktop 2, music on. Tell me if the music is too loud. Okay, again, we invite Venerable Hang Shua virtually online to sing the merit dedication to us. Please join our palms together. Is it loud enough?
made their minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light break the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Topin, are you showing the Buddha? Oh, okay, let us now uh, put our palms together and pay respect to the Buddha with three bows. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Let us now thank Venerable with three bows. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. <laughs> 